ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا برشدا ونصلي ونسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع هداه All praises are due to Allah, the Creator, the Cherisher, and the Sustainer of this universe. And may His peace and blessings be upon His noble Prophet Muhammad and His companions and descendants and followers. Dear respected brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah Khairan for coming on time. This is the fourth session of the eight-week workshop of reflections on Surah Al-Kahf. As we said again and again, we have to remind ourselves that the Prophet Sallallahu commanded us to read this surah every single week and <clears throat> since he specified a surah then this means that there are meanings in this surah that should be renewed in the life of the believer at least once every week these meanings are so important and this surah has a big impact on our tarbiya, on nourishing ourselves, educating ourselves, disciplining oneself. And we said that the surah has three main axes of tarbiya. The first is tarbiya aqaidiya, in the uh, the axis of tarbiya in the field of aqida, and that is the tarbiya. Um, uh, the methodology of thinking and that is the tarbiyah of the values we took before the aqidah axis we took the uh, axis of uh, we discussed together the axis of how this surah changes the values and also today inshallah we will continue speaking about the uh, methodology of thinking last time we started this verse and it's one of the most important actually verses that can uh, reform one's um, thinking uh, methods and and uh, change us from being subjective to being objective and this is verse number 15 and today we will also continue speaking about verse number 15. We will go to other surahs of the Quran to see how it, uh, they are serving the same cause of this verse as well. The verse says, These people of ours have taken gods other than him, other than Allah. Who is speaking here? The youth who slept in the cave. And they are speaking about their people who were kuffar, who were actually worshipping others besides Allah. So they are criticizing them by saying, these people of ours have taken gods other than him. Why do they not produce clear evidence about them? If they just can bring evidence, which means what? That if there is evidence on another God, we will worship him. To this extent, the Quran takes Muslims, telling them, follow the evidence. We are truth seekers. We are just truth seekers. And I told you that when the Prophet ﷺ was entering the debate against the Christians of Najran, Allah told him to tell them, قل, قل, say, say, O Muhammad. Every qul in the Quran means say, Ya Muhammad. Qul, Ya Muhammad. Say, قُلْ لَوْ كَانَ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ وَلَدٌ فَأَنَا أَوَلُ الْعَابِدِينَ If the Rahman has a son, I'll be the first one to worship him. So we are truth seekers. This shows you to what extent Islam is very objective. And it tells us always to, act, to take action and to, and to work and, uh, based on evidence and proof. And last time I told you to search the Starbucks issue. You remember this? Many of you are boycotting Starbucks. And today after I finish, inshallah, I want to listen to you. What did you find about Starbucks? Is it really uh, uh, supporting Israel? So we will talk about this. But now we need to understand that Islam told us to ascertain before you do any action or, or you take any measures against people, you have to ascertain 
before you repeat things you have to ascertain and the prophet and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in surah al-hujurat ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in ja'akum fasiqun bi naba'in fatabayyanu an tusibu qawman bi jahalatin fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimin believers allah is talking to us ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu believers so you should yani listen to what's next because what's next is is probably a command from Allah to you believers if a troublemaker brings you news check it first in case you wrong others unwittingly and later regret what you have done so we don't want to regret what we have done here we need to speak about a very important incident that happened in the Muslim society at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The historians say and the ulama of Sirah say that this is the biggest earthquake that has shaken the Muslim community. Much bigger than Uhud's defeat. Much bigger than many of the calamities that have happened to the Muslims. This is the biggest incident. It is the slander. Some people slandered Lady Aisha. So Lady Aisha herself is narrating to us what happened. I'll be reading and every now and then I'll be stopping and reflecting on what she's saying. Lady Aisha narrated that whenever Allah's messenger intended to go out on a journey, he would draw lots amongst his wives and would take with him the one upon whom the lot fell. During one of his ghazawat, one of his battles, he drew lots amongst us and the lot fell upon me. And I proceeded with him after Allah had decreed the use of the veil, which means that the Prophet ﷺ used to draw lots to choose randomly one of his wives to come with him when he travels. Can we just stop the kids? Uh, excuse me. Can who's who's the um, who's the mother of those uh, little beautiful children? Take them because kids get kidnapped in London these days. Okay. Um, what was I saying? This is my problem when I'm interrupted. By the way. Yeah, okay, Lady Aish. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, chooses one of the uh, uh, wives to come with him on any journey when he travels, randomly. The lots fell on Lady Aisha in one of the battles. Which battle is this? We don't care. She didn't tell us. This is something that you need to understand, that details are important when they are important. But it's, it's nothing that, that will add to our uh, issue or to the lesson that we're taking now. So you see sometimes the Quran, and we will see this inshallah in the next sessions, ignoring sometimes the details that doesn't help. For example, you will see this in the story of Ashab al-Kahf, when uh, the Quran tells you some would, people will say there were three and the fourth was a dog, some would say five and the sixth was a dog, some would say seven and the eighth was a dog. Say, and we're waiting for the Quran to tell us, say, huh, how many? Only Allah knows how many. Which means it doesn't matter. It's not important. And still you find people saying, but probably they were the seven and the eighth was a dog. Subhanallah, the Quran ignored it ignored it on purpose to tell you focus on what's important so here the lady lady Aisha is saying one of the battles he chose me um, actually the lots fell on me and I went with him and that was after the decree of the veil the veil here means the, the, the niqab actually it means the total separation between the wives of the prophet and people so in this case she will be carried in a hawdaj she said, I was carried in a howdaj on a camel. This is what a howdaj is. The howdaj is like a, a, a small tent which is put on the camel and the people inside and, and the women inside cannot be seen. They can even be free to take off their hijab and everything. When the order of setting off was given, I walked till I was past the army to answer the call of nature. She wanted to, to uh, go to the toilet. There was no toilets at that time. So people used to walk until they disappear, until no one can see them. So it's like about like half a mile or a mile away from the army to answer the call of nature. 
After finishing, I returned to the camp to depart with the others, and suddenly I realized that my necklace over my chest was missing. Looks like it fell. So I returned to look it to look for it and was delayed because of that. She kept looking for it. It's a long distance, walking, looking for her necklace. The people who used to carry me on the camel came to my howdaj and put it on the back of the camel thinking that I was in it. As at that time women were light in weight and thin and lean and did not use to eat much. So it, which means at that time, by the way, the Muslims were poor. So people didn't, women didn't gain weight, she said. Women didn't gain weight yet. Okay, so she wants to say that she was light, so the people who carried the howdaj did not realize the difference in weight. So they put it on the camel, and they didn't say that Aisha is not inside, they thought that she's inside. So those people did not feel the difference in the heaviness of the howdaj while lifting it, and they put it over the camel. At that time, I was a young lady. They set the camel moving and proceeded on. I found my necklace after the army had gone and came to, th and came to their camp to find nobody. So she, she went found that the army left. So I went to the place where I used to stay thinking that they would discover my absence and come back in my search. And that was very clever from Lady Aish. If she tries to walk in the desert alone, she may get lost. And if you get lost in the desert of Arabia, you're dead. She said, I just sat where I always sit. And I said, they will realize at a certain point, maybe the prophet goes to her howdah, speak to her, and then they discover that she's not in. So they come back to find her where she is. So she sat in her place. She said, I went to the place where I used to stay, thinking that they would discover my absence and come back in my search. While in that state, I felt sleepy and I slept. Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal as-Sulami was behind the army and reached my abode in the morning. Armies at that time used to be followed by science. They leave someone who follows the army like about like half a day, like few hours behind the army, just checking if someone is coming to attack from behind or if someone maybe also uh, dropped something. So always it's followed by uh, someone who is following the army by few hours so that if anything happens or any attack from an, any enemy, he can go quickly and warn. So while walking, while in that state, I felt sleepy and I slept. Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal al-Sulami was behind the army and reached my place in the morning. When he saw a sleeping person, he came to me and he used to see me before veiling. So he used to see Lady Aisha before the veil was decreed. So he knows how she looks. So he saw her. So she woke up on him saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Va'inatu Rasulillah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon means we are for Allah and to him we return. The wife of the Prophet. He made his camel knelt down, so he knelt his camel down, and he got down from his camel and put his leg on the front legs, and then I rode, which means he put his legs like a step for her to step on his legs so that he doesn't have to uh, uh, touch her or, or, or touch her hand uh, or anything. So she put her uh, hand on the neck of the camel and the other, and her, her feet on his uh, uh, leg, and she rode the camel. <coughs> Safwan set out walking. He was walking and she was on the camel, leading the camel by the rope till we reached the army who had halted to take rest at midday. Then whoever was meant for destruction fell into destruction. Which means some people accused me falsely. In other narrations, we know that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, who is the head of the hypocrites, the head of the hypocrites in Medina. He is someone who was prepared to become the king of Medina until the Prophet ﷺ came and became the leader of the Medina. So this man was so um, uh, envious. He envied the Prophet ﷺ and he envied the Muslims so much. He pretended to be Muslim, but he was not. So when he saw her coming, he said, huh, the wife of your Prophet spent the night with someone else. Wallahi, ma salimat minhu wa la salima minha, none of them was safe from the other. 
And she says here, and the leader of the false accusers was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. After that, we returned to Medina. And I became ill for one month while the people were spreading the forged statements of the false accusers. So people were repeating. Here we need to understand that the rumors Arab Lady Aisha started by the hypocrites. But unfortunately, it was repeated by many Muslims. Just repeating. They didn't say that she did this or did that. They say, we heard that this and that happened, such and such happened, just repeating like that. She said, I all this time she didn't know what's happening and all the rumors spreading, but she was staying at home and she was so ill, she didn't know what's happening. She said, I was feeling during my ailment as if I were not receiving the usual kindness from the Prophet Sallallahu which I used to receive from him when I got sick. The Prophet was different. But she didn't know what's wrong with him. Maybe something is bothering him. She doesn't know. But usually when she's sick, he's more kind than that. But he would come, greet me and say, How is that girl? How is that girl? I did not know anything of what was going on till I recovered from my ailment. And went out with Umm Mistah to the Manasir where we used to answer the call of nature. At that time in Medina, there was no toilets in the, in the houses. And the people used to uh, walk outside Medina to a place outside called Al Manasa where people um, uh, answer the call of nature. So women used to go together. Okay, so as not to go in this area, it's dangerous to go alone. So she went with Umm Mustah. Actually, actually, until today, women go together to the bathrooms. I don't know why. Yeah, you're sitting, having dinner, something. Would you like to go to the bathroom? Yeah, okay, they go to the bathroom together. I don't know why. But anyway, she went with Umm Mistah. And when we used not to go to the answer, the call of nature, except from night to night, and that was before we had lavatories near to our houses. And this habit of ours was similar to the habit of the old Arabs in the open country or away from houses. So, I and Umm Mistah bin Turuham went out walking. Umm Mistah stumbled. She stumbled and fell because of her long dress. And on that, when she stumbled, she said, Ta'isa Mistah. Her own son, she like cursed him or uh, he, she made dua against him. She said, let Mistah be ruined when she fell down. I said, you are saying a bad word. Why are you abusing a man who took part in the Battle of Badr? You actually, in the, in the Muslim community, there was a, a, a very special uh, res, uh, uh, rank, or actually like a lot of respect for those who participated in Badr, because they were mentioned in the Quran and so on. And she said, how come you say so about a man for, who participated in Badr? She said, O Hanata, which means, O oh, you there, didn't you hear what they said? So you don't know what, what's, what's happening and the rumors? Then she told me the rumors of the false accusers. I, I have a feeling that the lady really wanted to tell her. <laughs> So she like invented this to tell her. Sometimes, you know, people uh, cannot keep a secret. Okay. I don't want to say especially women because this is offensive for you. But it's especially women actually. <laughs> but actually there's so many men like that also. They cannot keep a secret. She cannot. And she knows that since a whole month there are rumors spread around her and she doesn't know. So she told her. I don't know what does that have to do with her stumbling and falling. But anyway, she told her. My sickness was aggravated. She became sick back and she was, she was like, like psychologically actually shocked. And when I returned home, Allah's messenger came to me. And after greeting me, he said, how is that girl? I requested him to allow me to go to my parents. She said, please allow me to go to my parents' house. I wanted then to be sure of the news through them. She really wanted someone reliable to speak to and to ask about what's happening, but she cannot ask the Prophet ﷺ himself now. Allah's Messenger allowed me, and I went to my parents and asked my mom, what are the people talking about? 
She said, oh, my daughter, don't worry much about this matter. Don't worry much about this matter. By Allah, never is there a charming woman loved by her husband who has other wives, but the women would forge false news about her. So this is like yani envy. People envy you because you're beautiful. You're married to the prophet. So of course, this will happen. On that day, I kept on weeping so much so that neither did my tears stop, nor could I sleep. She can't sleep, They're traumatized, and she keeps weeping all the time. In the morning, my parents were with me, and I had wept for two nights and a day, till I thought my liver would burst from weeping. While they were sitting with me, and I was weeping, an Ansari woman asked my, per my permission to enter and I allowed her to come in and she sat down and started weeping with me. This is something, for example, I, I, I am Egyptian and in the villages in Egypt, in the uh, country, uh, there is this, when, when women want to support each other, if, if a calamity happens, like a woman uh, lost a son or lost a husband or something, other women go in, um, to support her by weeping with her. Even by pretending that they are weeping, by the way. I have seen that. It's very funny, by the way. But anyway, it looks like they had the same tradition. So this woman, when she learned that she's ill and she learned about the rumors, so she wanted to give support by going and weeping with her. While we were in this state, sitting and weeping, Allah's messenger came and sat down. And he had never sat with me since the day they forged the accusation. It's the first time for about a month since a month that he sits with her now. It's a, a month without revelation, by the way. Allah did not descend, Jibreel did not come down during that month. That's why it, I'm telling you, it is the biggest earthquake that has shaken the Muslim community. No revelation regarding my case came to him for a month. He recited shahada. He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah And then said, O Aisha, I have been informed such and such about you. You know, any man at that situation, at this situation, which is a very difficult one, if he hears things like that about his wife, <coughs> especially an Arab at that time also, he will either act very uh, violently or angrily or at least shake her from the shoulders and say, tell me the truth. At least tell me the truth. But look at the Prophet Sallallahu how loving and tender he is. He said, oh Aisha, I have been informed such and such about you. If you are innocent, then let know that Allah will soon reveal your innocence. And if you have committed a sin, he didn't say tell me, he said, repent to Allah and ask him to forgive you. For when a person confesses his sin and asks Allah for forgiveness, Allah accepts his repentance. This is the most merciful human being ever. When Allah's messenger finished his words, my tears ceased completely and there remained not even a single drop of it. I requested my father to reply to Allah's messenger on my behalf. He's her father who brought her up and he knows his daughter. So she told him, Dad, reply to the Prophet Sallallahu He's telling me to repent if I sinned and that Allah will prove my, my innocence. She's expecting that her father will defend her saying, this is my daughter and I know how I raised her. And I, and she, but because I'm telling you for about a month, the rumors has been spread so much, her dad shocked her by saying, I don't know what to say to the Prophet of Allah. She said, so I looked to my mother and I said, mom, answer the Prophet of Allah. At least her mom would defend her. Her mom said, by Allah, I don't know what to say to the Prophet of Allah. See now, Lady Aisha, by the way, that was two years after her marriage. She was like 11. She said, I was a young girl and did not have much knowledge of the Quran. I said, I know by Allah 
that you have listened to what people have been saying about me and that it has been planted in your minds and you believed it now if I told you that I am innocent and to herself she's saying and Allah knows that I'm innocent you would not believe me and if I confess to you that I am guilty and Allah knows that I am innocent you would believe me because they kept listening to this again and again and again so they will never believe her if she says I'm innocent and if she says I sinned they will believe so the point is why talk then then there's no difference if I talk or not if I defend myself or not so I'm not gonna tell you anything she said by Allah I don't compare my situation with you except to the situation of Joseph's father she even forgot the name Yaqub Jacob and she said Abu Yusuf I don't find anything more fitting for me except فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ Beautiful patience is what is most fitting for me and I seek refuge with Allah from what you think about me. Then I turned to the other side of my bed. She gave them her back and she turned to the other side of the bed hoping that Allah would prove my innocence. By Allah, I never thought that Allah would reveal divine revelation about me. I considered myself too inferior to be talked of in the Holy Quran. I had hoped that Allah's messenger might have a dream in which Allah would prove any innocence. All she wanted is that Allah shows the Prophet a dream, a vision in his sleep that proves her innocence. She never thought that he will receive revelation from above seven heavens talking about Lady Aisha's innocence. By Allah, Allah's apostle had not got up and nobody had left the house before the divine inspiration came to Allah's apostle. So there overtook him the same state which used to overtake him when the Quran descends on him. So in between them, before leaving the house, in front of everybody, the, the state that happens to him happened and he started to receive revelation. And Allah received her innocence with the verses that we will discuss now, inshallah. Surely they who spread the slander are a gang among you. And we will talk about this, inshallah. And she said, uh, when the state of Allah's messenger was over, he was smiling. And the first word he said, Aisha, thank Allah, for Allah has declared your innocence. My mother told me to go to Allah's messenger and thank him. I replied, by Allah, I will not go to him and I will not thank except Allah. She was angry. She was angry. Allah proved her innocence, but still she expected more support from others, from the Prophet and from the mother of her mother and from uh, her, her, her father. But actually, if you look at the Prophet's approach, it is uncompared with anyone in history. When someone hears this about his wife and he is so patient like that for about a month and then when she's weeping and she's ill, he goes and he like, yeah, and he tells her yeah, and he nicknames like for uh, how's that girl and he sits on the side of her bed and he asks her to repent if she has done, done anything wrong repent between her and Allah not necessarily tell him at all when Allah gave the declaration of my innocence I want to tell you that the Prophet ﷺ gave a big space for freedom of speech in his house to all his wives and Lady Aisha especially really enjoyed this freedom of speech. Yani, Imam Ahmad in one of his books mentioned that she used to say that she used to like step on, uh, stand over one of the furniture or a table or something. And she tells the prophet, come here, catch me. You the one who claims to be a prophet. And he runs after her and they keep running over the furniture and playing together. But the word itself is so <laughs> it's so serious, so dangerous actually. If someone says so seriously, he will, leave, he will be a kafir actually. But she was like, 
having fun a lot with the Prophet and sometimes like exceeds limits a little bit. And this shows the actually, I'm not saying that what she said was, was, was okay, but I'm saying that to this extent the Prophet gave freedom of speech. As long as they are having fun, as long as they are laughing, he allowed things like that to happen. When Allah gave the declaration of my innocence, Abu Bakr, who used to provide for Mistah, Mistah ibn Uthatha, this man whom his uh, uh, mother uh, uh, made dua against him, and then she told Lady Aisha, this man was a relative of Abu Bakr Siddiq, a far relative, and he was actually a poor man, whom Abu Bakr used to pay him monthly, a pension every month. So Abu Bakr, stopped paying him and then Allah revealed in the Quran and let not those who are good and wealthy among you swear not to help their kinsmen those in need and those who left their homes in Allah's cause because he was a muhajir from Mecca let them forgive and overlook do you not wish that Allah should forgive you? Surely Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. So Abu Bakr said, no, I definitely want Allah to forgive me. And he started to pay him again, and he even doubled his pension. Those were the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ. This is where how the Quran was shaping their personalities, doing terbiyah to them. They read the Quran, they change their attitude. They read the Quran, they change their behavior. But the problem today is, we read the Quran separately from our life. We just have time for the Quran and we have our life. That has nothing to do with the Quran. This is a problem. The Quran is sent mainly to be read, understood, reflected upon and to change us. It's instructions from Allah, instructions that should be followed. This is them and this is us. And because we are like that, this is our case now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended these verses, proving the innocence of Lady Aisha. Inna alladheena jāu bil ifki usbatum minkum, la tahsabuhu sharran lakum, bal huwa khayrun lakum. Likul imri'in minhum maktasaba bin al-ith, wa alladhi tawalla kibarahu minhum, lahu adhabun azim. It was a group from among you that concocted the lie do not consider it a bad thing to you for you it was a good thing and every one of them will be charged with the sin he has earned he who took the greatest part in it will have a painful punishment this verse in itself shows me a lot of objectivity actually when the slander is called something good not something bad why is it good because we learned from it it's a lesson for us. So just when something negative happens, try to look to the positive things in it. Try to look to the positive things in it. For example, if I tell you to describe this bottle of water, you can tell me that uh, uh, those who are negative will say, it's a bottle of water, but there's a, an empty part in it. Some will say, it's a bottle of water nearly full. It's the same. It's, it's the same answer, by the way, but this is a positive way, this is a negative way. Everything has something positive. You can find something positive in everything. Look for it and build on it. So here the Quran is telling us that it's not bad, it's good. Why? Because we're going to learn. Learn back. For example, the next verse says, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا وَقَالُوا هَذَا إِفْكُمْ مُبِينَ When you heard the lie, why did believing men and women not think well of themselves and declare this is obviously a lie? Can you imagine this? What is the verse saying? That you should have thought well about yourself it should have actually I would understand that it says you should have thought well about each other but it said about yourself be enfusim why because it's telling you that you and the Muslim and other Muslims are one if something is 
is, is uh, if something bad happens to one of the Muslims, it's as if it happened to you yourself. If a rumor is spread against a Muslim, it's as if it happened to you yourself. So it is like making Muslims feel sympathy towards each other by telling them, why didn't you think well of, the, of, the, of yourselves? And actually what happened here is that two of the Sahaba, Abu Darda and his wife, I believe that is Abu Darda. Abu Darda and his wife, when they heard about the slander, the rumors, they came to a conclusion. They finally said it's, it's impossible. How? Abu Darda told his wife, if you were in Aisha's shoes, if you were in the same situation, would you commit adultery with uh, Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal? She said, definitely not. And he told her, if I were in Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal's shoes, if I were in that situation, I would never commit adultery with Lady Aisha, of course. And since Safwan is better than me, and since Aisha is better than you, Therefore, this never happened. See how they, they thought. Every Muslim, by the way, doesn't think well about himself. himself. Because actually, I should always feel like other Muslims are better than me. So he looked at Safwan as someone better than him. And Lady Aisha definitely is better than other women. He said, since you don't do that, and I don't do that, then they did not do that. خلاص, انتهى. So that was beautiful. A beautiful approach from them. And this is what the verse is telling us. When you heard the lie, why did believing men and women not think well of themselves and declare this is obliviously, this is obviously a lie. The next verse says, لَوْ لَا جَاءُوا عَلَيْهِ بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءِ فَإِذْ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِالشُهَدَاءِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْكَاذِبُونَ and why did the accusers not bring four witnesses to it? If they cannot produce such witnesses, they are the liars in God's eyes. Therefore, in Islamic fiqh, in Islamic sharia, if three men, if three men claim that two people committed fornication or adultery, those three men should be lashed on their backs and they are considered liars even if they are not lying because there is no four if there is no if they don't have a fourth they should just keep silent they don't talk and they are considered liars even if they are not lying in islam the more the consequences the more the proof is needed that's why here in this case the case of adultery and fornication four people are needed not two and this is how it is the the, the more serious the consequences the more proof is needed because in islamic sharia ah, there is no room for anyone to be wronged no room for anyone to be wronged and Allah says, وَلَوْلَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ لَمَسَّكُمْ فِي مَا أَفَضْتُمْ فِيهِ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ If it were not for God's bounty and mercy towards you in this world and the next, you would already have been afflicted by terrible suffering for indulging in such talk. Which means that Allah have forgiven the Muslims who actually repented, of course. And I, by the way, some of many of the uh, Sahaba were lashed on their backs for participating in this land. Among them is Hassan ibn Thabit, by the way, the poet, the poet of the Prophet. He was lashed on his back, and others, and some women also. And then the Quran says, "If talqaunahu bi al sinatikum wa taqulun bi afwahikum ma lais lakum bihi ilm." وَتَحْسِبُونَهُ هَيِّنًا وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ When you received it with your tongues, do people receive with their tongues? 
People receive with their ears. But the Quran says, when you received it with your tongues, which means like parrots, you just heard and said, when you receive with your ear, before saying anything, the words will go into your mind and you will think about it, is it damaging or not, before you speak. But here, it's like you're like parrots, you receive with your tongues. And when you received it with your tongues and spoke with your mouth things you did not know to be true. You thought it was trivial, but to God it was very serious. You just speak about people and you keep accusing people and you think it's trivial. Allah takes these things very seriously. It's very serious for Allah when you accuse people of anything if you don't have evidence. ولولا إذ سمعتموه قلتم ما يكون لنا أن نتكلم بهذا سبحانك هذا بهتان عظيم When you heard the lie, why did you not say we should not repeat this? God forbid, it is a monstrous slander. So when you hear anything about anyone without evidence, you should just say we do not repeat this. This is a monstrous slander, even if it's right. right. On the Day of Judgment, we will know if it's right or not. If there is no evidence, you don't accuse people and we don't even participate in spreading rumors. God warns you never to do anything like this again if you are true believers. If you are true believers. So a true believer cannot participate in spreading rumors. Even if she's wearing hijab, even if she's wearing niqab, even if it's a long beard, they are not true believers. Do you think the hypocrites had what? They had beards. Long beards. And they were wearing niqab and they were wearing hijab. But they acted hypocritically. This is how we do tarbiyah to ourselves. If the Quran is not going to change us, then nothing will change us. Nothing will change us. So we need to ascertain. Okay. <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ said, rajul zaamu." It is a bad riding beast for a man to say zaamu, which means they asserted. When 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 someone just repeats things and you ask him, "How did you know that?" They say. They asserted so. They said so. That's not an evidence. You cannot just repeat things that you hear. And he has another hadith which is so important that he says, حَزْبُ امْرِئٍ مِنَ الْكَذِبِ أَنْ يُحَدِّثَ بِكُلِّ مَا سَمِعَ A man, actually this is Umar ibn Khattab, a man is reckoned to be lying when he gives voice to all what he hears. Which means not everything that you hear you repeat. You can be considered a liar for repeating what you hear. Don't repeat what you hear. The first thing that, one of the things that I learned when I started learning Islam is Al-Abrar Quburul Asrar. Al-Abrar means the righteous people. Plural of Bar. Al-Abrar, the righteous. Qubur, which means tombs, graves. The righteous people are the graves of asrar, of secrets. So you hear the secret and it doesn't come out again. Why? Because you are like a grave for the secrets. When people go to there, are, are, are actually buried in their graves, they don't come out again. You should be like a grave for secrets. Okay, what is a secret? Is the secret something that I tell you and then I tell you, be careful, that's a secret? That's not. That's a secret, definitely. But the ulama said that the secret is anything that I tell you and I turn my face to the other side. So if I tell you any news and I don't tell you you are free to say this anywhere, then it's a secret. Hmm. Did, did, you, did you do your homework? Is Starbucks coffee uh, the Palestinian blood? Is Starbucks supporting Israel? Who did the homework? Who found any uh, anything from his research? Yeah, what did you find? Um, I just read on Wikipedia that the CEO of Starbucks Coffee, he um, supports Israel, has um, lots 
Wikipedia. This in Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> is Wikipedia a reliable source? It's not. Anyone can create anything on Wikipedia. Good. So on Wikipedia, there are articles that say that the CEO of uh, uh, Starbucks supports Israeli groups. Okay? Good. Anything else? Did anyone else find anything? Okay. Did you find this, well, the statement of the CEO of Starbucks saying we don't mix coffee with, with politics and we don't support Israel? You haven't seen that. Okay, these are facts about Starbucks, by the way. Worldwide, they work in 65 countries. They have 21,000 stores. In the Middle East, they, they work in 12 countries and they have 600 stores in the Middle East. The 12 countries in the Middle East are Bahrain, Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Morocco, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Tunisia, and the United Arab Emirates. How many stores in, uh, in Israel? Zero stores. They opened in 2001 and they closed in 2003. Not for any politics. They say we had a problem with our uh, Israeli partner. But they have in, in the 12 Arab countries, it is Ashaya, who is actually a Kuwaiti uh, businessman. He is the Starbucks uh, uh, distributor or something like that. They had a distributor in Israel and they had a problem with him and they closed. They said, not because anyone boycotted us, but actually at that time I was in the States. And we really boycott Starbucks at that time because they opened those six stores in Israel. Actually, all companies have stores in Israel, but they opened some of their stores in the settlements. So the Muslims of uh, the United States started a big campaign to boycott Starbucks in 2003 when they closed it. We announced in the uh, mosques everywhere that Starbucks have closed their stores in the settlements. I didn't know actually that they closed totally in, this, in Israel. I didn't know that. I just knew it a few days ago when I researched. So you're talking about a company that works in 65 countries and Israel is not one of them. You know who's behind this? The people who want you to be intoxicated with these things thinking that if you boycott Starbucks, you did your part, alhamdulillah, in supporting the Palestinian cause. Excuse me, that's not. That's not what you need to do. You need to work, you need to support, you need to integrate, you need to be influential in this country. Like others are supporting their original country that they came from by being influential here. You have to be influential here to support as well. But intoxicating you by telling you but that by not buying Starbucks, you are helping Palestine like that. This is a fallacy. This is how they, this, are, this is drugs for our minds. So this is just to, uh, to, um, to conclude. Actually, uh, do we have 15 more minutes or not? Who are the organizers here? We have 15 more minutes to, okay. Now let's talk a little bit also more about objectivity. What we learn from the Quran is objectivity. The verse that says, those are our people, they worshiped a God besides Allah. If they just have evidence, shows me that I need to be objective. Among the things that makes us not objective is that sometimes we exaggerate a lot when we talk. And actually the Quran told us to avoid the exaggerations of other people before us. So you find the Persians exalting so much Kisra, Kisro. He's a political individual. So they exalted him so much. The Romans, they exalted political people. So actually the Romans did not exalt their Caesars, but they exalted the Romans. People are either Romans or barbarians. This is, the world was like that, like uh, cent uh, 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 15 centuries ago. Romans considered the world to be Romans and barbarians. So they exalted their people on political basis. Christians exalted a religious individual. Jesus is an individual, but they exalted him so much and they ended up worshiping him. Jews exalted a religious people. So Jews do not exalt their prophets, actually. 
But they exalted the sons of Israel or the Israelite race and in itself based on religion. So they exalted him. So you see here, those are the four main mistakes <coughs> that happen when people exaggerate. Exalting a political individual like the Persians. You see, the Quran is dealing with this very objectively by saying, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلَ انْقَلَبَتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرَّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا وَسَيَجْزِ اللَّهُ الشَّاكِرِينَ In Surah Al-Imran. Muhammad is only a messenger before whom many messengers have been gone. They came and died. Who will listen to this and then exalt the Prophet as a political individual? So the Prophet, as a political individual, he was the governor of the Muslims at that time. He was not taking decisions individually. He was actually having his consultants. He was having women as political consultants, like Lady Umm Salama. He was asking people. He was, take, he was taking the votes, like what happened in Uhud. Before Uhud, he gathered people, all the Muslims, men and women, in the mosque and told them, I have uh, information that came to me. Uh, <coughs> that there are 4,000 people marching now towards us in Medina. So what do you think? Should we go out and face them and fight them outside or should we wait here in Medina and fight them from street to street? And he had the opinion of fighting in Medina from street to street. Street war, not outside. Why? Because there are so many and we are much less than them. And here we know Medina, we can do traps for them, for the invading uh, uh, army. You know who agreed with him and wanted also to fight street war in Medina? Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the head of the hypocrites. Why? Because for him, the hypocrites can stay at home and no one knows that they are not participating in the, in the, in the fighting. For the Prophet ﷺ, it is better for them militarily, yani, yani, uh, uh, militarily that they fight from street to street because they can do traps and that even women and children can participate by like throwing uh, on them rocks and stones from above the, 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 the houses or stuff like that. But what happened? The voting went to no, we will go out and face them outside Medina. And the Prophet submitted to what the Muslims wanted and what the majority decided, and they went out. So he wasn't treated like Kisra. He did not have a palace. If anyone comes from outside Medina, he cannot see the palace of the Prophet. He's just a house like other houses. He used to sit with the Sahaba on the floor, eating with them. No one knows. He's not wearing something special, not having a throne, not having a special garment. Not sitting on a, on a chair and others are sitting on the floor, like now. No. Because the Qur'an has made tarbiyah. The Qur'an changes people. Changes people. Also, they did not exalt the Arabs as political people, like the Romans exalted their, 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 themselves, the Romans as political people as were actually exalted. They thought themselves the only civil, civilized people in the world and others are barbarians. The Prophet وسلم, said, من قاتل تحت راية عامية يغضب لعصبة أو يدعو إلى عصبية أو ينصر عصبة فقتل فقتلته جاهلية. The one who fights under the banner of a people blindly do not know whether their cause is just or otherwise, who gets flared up with family pride, calls people to fight for their family honor and support his kin <coughs> by fighting not for the cause of Allah, but for the sake of the family and the tribe. If he is killed in this fight, he dies as, a, as one belonging to the days of Jahiliyyah. The ignorance uh, phase which preceded Islam. Yeah, the Arabs used to say like, this man is a very strong man. If he's angry, 100 swords are raised out for him. Fighting because he's angry, not knowing why is he angry and they don't even dare to ask.
this is haram when you just like and we have a lot of that oh, by the way one of these things is I'm sorry this can offend many of you actually those who are like soccer fans or football fans they just uh, are, are uh, fans because or they, they, they really wish their team to win just because they are Egyptians like them or just because they are British like them excuse me I want them to win if they win, if they play well and deserve it why do I just want my people to win every single thing if they even if they do wrong even if they don't deserve it or if they don't deserve it let them not win be objective this is called asabiya tribalism exalting religious individual the Prophet Sallallahu warned them and he said لا تطروني كما أطرت النصارى ابن مريم فإنما أنا عبده فقولوا عبد الله ورسوله do not exaggerate in praising me as the Christians praised the son of Mary for I am only a servant of Allah so call me the servant of Allah and his apostle see the objectivity who will dare to worship the Prophet after saying so about himself? خلاص أنا عبد and this led to the dearest companion of the Prophet وسلم, Abu Bakr after the death of the Prophet when people like couldn't believe it and Omar said if someone says I will that he died I will kill him and Ali fainted and Abu Bakr Siddiq the dearest he came out and he spoke and he said the one who used to worship Muhammad let know that Muhammad is dead and the one who used to worship Allah Allah is alive and he doesn't die he was he 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 he, he was back to his mind quickly actually because of this terbeer exalting religious people maybe the Arabs are the best Muslims excuse me I'm an Arab who are you I speak Arabic huh? the Prophet said he said there is no privilege for an Arab on a non-Arab except according to the level of piety and righteousness the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is the Arab no who the man males no who the rich no whites no who the most righteous of you that's it the most honored are the most righteous can be non-arab can be black can be woman can be poor so this how islam changed people change them quickly actually that's why the scholars say the biggest miracle of the quran is not the scientific miracles the biggest miracle is the followers of the prophet sallallahu look at them how they change dramatically with the quran this is how we used to take the quran very seriously we have to read the quran and reflect upon its meanings every single verse in the quran is loaded with messages to your hearts just decode it decode the messages and try to find the beauty and the messages that are sent to you to change okay jazakumullah khairan barakallahu feekum next week inshallah we will probably take the fiqh of priorities how can i choose how can i prioritize things okay so inshallah next time is a very important uh, session if you want to ans ask any question maybe we can take few questions before we pray any questions yes ma'am I don't know what, what Muhammad Musa did. What, wasn't it a good thing? Yeah. That Muhammad Musa told Sayyidah Aisha, but what was being said about her? Because it, was, it must have been very difficult for her to be the only one in Medina who doesn't know. Okay. And she can't explain why Muhammad Musa has changed everything. That's a good question. My, my opinion is I think she's done a good thing. Uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question, actually. Wasn't it good for Umm Musa to tell Lady Aisha? Is she supposed to like stay like that, not knowing what's happening? And because actually it happened to be good. Because actually, because of what happened, and she told her this whole story, now we are teaching in mosques, learning from it. 
but this is a matter of difference of opinions between people you can see that this is good it is something that if it happens uh, to you that you know that uh, uh, one of the ladies that you know there are rumors spread about her you should go and tell her and maybe I don't see that but uh, we can talk about that but there is no here religious opinion on this by the way actually uh, I think that the, the person should be informed but with a procedure yeah because Lady Aisha had terrible consequences after that she was like traumatized and she was she became ill so I think the, the close people to her should inform her in another yani in, in, in a better way that's what I think but I think yes you're right that she shouldn't be like ignorant of what's happening around her Jazakumullah khair okay any brother would like to ask a question okay here another question no questions? Okay, go ahead. Can you, can you uh, raise your voice? Tips of objective thinking. This actually, we have six sessions about objective thinking. This is one of them. So we spoke about that in the beginning. We said you should ascertain. You should not spread rumors. You should not speak without evidence. You should not speak about things that you don't have knowledge about. We will talk about how to think, uh, how to prioritize, how to choose next time, inshallah. So objective thinking is a big, actually, topic. A big topic. So we are taking all these sessions on objective thinking now. Okay? Anything else? Jazakumullah khairan, barakallahu fikum. Okay, I'll take another question. Of course, I will speak to him. Okay, good. Well, uh, if, if you learn that someone is spreading rumors about you and you were informed by someone that someone else is spreading rumors, but of course you don't want to reveal your source. You don't have to reveal your source. You go to her and you tell her, I heard that you're spreading rumors about me. How do you know? I heard from people that I trust that you are doing this. Okay? If you are really doing this, I will stand before Allah on the day of judgment and take my 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 uh, my uh, yani revenge from you. So please fear Allah. Stop doing that. Okay? She tells you, okay, give me the name. So I won't give you the name. But at the same time, you should not blindly also uh, believe the person who informed you too. You see here. So here it's about. In Surah Yusuf, there's a lot of the sister was asking about objective thinking. In Surah Yusuf, when Yusuf went to his father and he told him his dream that he has seen the sun and the moon and ten planets prostrating for him, he told him, Oh my son, uh, eleven planets, uh, uh, oh my son, do not tell your brothers about your dream lest that they would like plan to hurt you. Does that mean that we should think ill about other people? No. But it means that we shouldn't be idiots. Deal with people according to the qualities of them that you know about it. So when someone cannot keep a secret, don't go to them and tell her your secret. <coughs> so we neither think ill about people, nor at the same time we trust 100% Actually, sometimes we like just say like this is a, 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 a Muslim uh, brother who goes to the mosque and this is enough for me to trust and that's not enough to trust. And Umar ibn Khattab heard someone praising someone else. He told him, how do you know that he's that good? Don't tell me that you met him. Uh, uh, you see him in the mosque. Don't if you did not travel with him, deal with him with the dirham and dinar, deal with him financially. Then you did not, then you don't know him. You understand me? So don't, neither you put all your trust in someone, nor you also distrust everyone. Okay? Jazakumullah khair. Barakallahu feekum. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiru ka wa natubu ilayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusri ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat. Wa tawasabu al-haq wa tawasabu al-sabu. Jazakumullah khair.